Um, so this session is entitled Marks of a Revivalist. Marks of a Revivalist. And we're talking and continuing to talk about God's leadership because this is God's leadership unit. And if you do have the uh, Prezi, it's uh, Prezi.com, P-R-E-Z-I.com slash forward slash live forward slash holy fire. And that will bring you to the presentation and you'll see it progress as I progress through it. So let's let me introduce this to you. And you don't need the presentation um, if you don't have it. So you, you're not missing out. You can just listen if you don't have it. So now let's go to, I'm trying to go forward. Is this going to work or what? Excuse me for a second. All right. Now let's go to Acts 3.1. Acts 3.1. On Monday morning, I was reading this, and this whole passage jumped out at me. The Holy Spirit began to speak to me for tonight, and also for our Bible school back in uh, Brisbane City. Um, for those of you, if, uh, if you're on Facebook, you can uh, befriend me at Glenn Gerhauser. So it's G-E-R-H-A-U-S-E-R. -E -E you can friend me and you can follow uh, the different things we're doing. And I'd love to be friends with you on Facebook. Um, so I haven't shared this yet with the Brisbane School, but this is my first time sharing this with you. So we're in Acts 3 and we're going to be reading 1 through about one through six at first. So now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's room was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive receive arms, arms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. We'll keep on reading. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With the leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So tonight, we're going to focus on what are the marks of a revivalist. What's a revivalist? It's someone God uses to spark and lead revival. For example, uh, in our Bible school back in Brisbane, we talked about Josiah and how he recovered God's word. And this sparked the whole move of God among them. And it brought them to repentance and tearing down the idols. And it was a part of this process of repairing the temple. And today, more than ever, the temple of God needs to be repaired. And one thing that's on Cheryl's heart is the repairing of the altar. The altar of worship, the altar of prayer, the altar of sacrifice needs to be repaired. And when the altar is repaired, like Elijah repaired it, then the fire falls. But we all want the fire. We all want the glory. And what I'm saying is there's a way to get there. And the way is in repairing the altar. We're always 
always looking for the end without the way. So we want the fire. We want the glory. We want the souls to come in. We want the harvest. We want church growth. But God is saying there is a way. Follow me. Follow my word. Look to me. And when we and the way is something we don't like because it's grinding and it's painful and it's a process of humility and it takes time. And we are programmed as modern people to want things instantly. If the internet is not working that day, I'm sometimes frustrated at work because the internet doesn't work. And I'm like, oh, it's not working. It's not working. And we want things now. You know, there was a day where we didn't have mobile phones. And we couldn't, you know, call each other instantaneously. But now, more than ever, we want things instantaneously. I think it's started about when the microwave came out and we could make a meal in a minute and a half and uh, before you know it would take hours and hours to make a meal but now we'll freeze it put it in the microwave and there it is and our our psychology our thinking began to change about life but God's thinking hasn't changed yeah. he's not the microwave God <laughs> he's the God of the oven <laughs> Well, Solo, Solo here is, uh, this is my brother Solo, give me a slap, five. Solo has been a great blessing to the school in Brisbane City. He's been coming early and serving and, and cleaning up and uh, vacuuming and sweeping and setting up the tables and chairs uh, for... As long as I know, most of the time in the school, I had been doing that, but he's been serving to do that. Well, we were, it was before class, and there's a little oven we have in the center there at, uh, on Queen Street Mall. So if you don't know where the school is, it's in the Queen Street Mall. It's just a couple buildings down from Hungry Jack's, and it's the seventh floor, and we have a beautiful view of the city to pray for the city, and God brought us to that place. I was expecting a basement. Lord, just a basement, a place I want to, you know, I'm really into an underground move of God, so <laughs> let it be in a basement somewhere, but we prayed and God brought us to this place, uh, the real estate agent was bringing us around, and here's this place with this beautiful balcony, the only balcony like it in Queen Street Mall at that height, and the Lord said this, and it looked like a bit of a dump at first, but the Lord said this is the place. You know, you'll make it look nice and bring in the presence of God. And so that's where we are as a school. And now we're almost almost two years there. And we've been on the Queen Street Mall since 2010. Um, but before that was in a little closet. Uh, <laughs> very, and we had 30, 30 people in there just praying and seeking God and weeping. The air con was broken. It was hot. It was sweating. But they would, you know, we were praying till 11 o'clock, midnight, seeking the Lord. And none of the inconveniences stopped us from seeking the Lord. So it was a beautiful thing that God was doing. So he had this. He had the lasagna, and he was. He had it in the oven, and I said, "How long is it going to be in the oven?" He said, "45 minutes." I said, "45 minutes? Something you know? Put it in the microwave. It was like five minutes to make it." But what I'm saying is, the oven it takes longer. But God, but it's, it tastes better, doesn't it? I mean, try especially New York pizza. How many? I'm from New York. If you wonder what is that strange accent, I am from New York. My family's from Brooklyn, and uh, how many have been to New York? You've been there. Oh, you've been there. Yeah, great. There's a few of you. Few of you have been there. Um, did you have pizza in New York? Yes. Did you have pizza? Yes. Now, of course, New Yorks are snobs about pizzas. But to get the best pizza, you have to go to Long Island uh, or Brooklyn. They have more of the older style. You, the peep, the real New Yorkers have moved to Long Island and to Florida. <laughs> so, and the, the the new New York. 
Yorkers are the new migrants who are coming over. They don't have the culture of New York over the many years, but you have a lot of people from everywhere. Uh, new York is a real melting pot. But if you want the real pizza, you gotta go to Long Island. And when you put it in the microwave, it's soggy, doesn't taste the same. You have to have the right oven. So all these places that are saying uh, New York pizza uh, all around Brisbane, you gotta say, do they have the right oven? You know, and most of them don't have the right oven. But there's one place that does it good. It's called Burroughs of New York Pizza. It's in Carindale, and I think they have one in the Valley. But they have like a, uh, what is this? This oven, wood fire oven, which is a bit different than New York, but he does, they usually do such a good job that uh, you, I don't mind it. <laughs> <laughs> So it's an, if you put it in the oven, the pizza tastes good. And for the New Yorker, it's not about the toppings. It's about the, the dough and the bread, um, the, and the crust, the, the cheese, and the, the sauce, especially the sauce. And that's how you tell what a good pizza is. And they may have tight, yeah, so, <laughs> sauce. That's how you know. I need to teach you how to speak English. <laughs> So God's process, it takes time. We're in the idea of instant. And so we need to allow God to make us and form us. And he's looking to make revivalists. So all of God's leaders are called to be revivalists. And in other words, we're called to minister life. Because the word revival is life again. And God is revival because God is life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. So if you're with God, you are revived. If the whole church is unrevived, you be revived. Amen. And if you are in the presence of God, you can't help but be revived. So don't blame it on the church. You just walk in that revival yourself. As Gypsy Smith said, we've been talking about this at Brisbane. He said he drew a circle around himself and he said, Lord, revive everything that's in this circle. He stood in the circle and said, Lord, revive everything that's in the circle. Because we're often concerned about the other people and the other churches. And uh, what about this brother, that brother? You... Allow God to revive you. Amen. God will take care of the rest. Right? But we have a heart for other people in intercession and prayer. And we want to be ministers of life. But the only way to be ministers of life is if we're connected to the vine. Yes. And so we are called to be ministers of life, God's life, resurrection life. When these two men here, Peter and John, the apostles raised up this lame man, they were ministering the resurrection of life, yes. of Jesus' life to him, yes. which caused them to stand up and walk and to jump and to leap and praise God. And he was transformed from being this beggar into a worshiper. And this is what we're looking to accomplish in our leadership. They became a fisher of men. And here there's Peter's began, beginning to learn now to what it means to be a fisher of men. And he's, he fishes this guy out of the ocean depth of the world. So now I want to look at some of these characteristics of, revival, of revivalists that we find in this passage. These are the things that stood out to me as I read this passage. So part one marks of a revivalist. Number one is prayer. Yes. <laughs> and this is the mark of a real leader. We see in Acts 3.1, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. So it was an hour of prayer. It was a time, you know, spent in prayer. This was not just run in, run out. This is not prayer as you're putting on your clothes. 
and that's okay, but this was, we need to go deeper in prayer. Yes. Apostolic praying, and this is consistent prayer. This is yes. continual prayer. This is, not, this is a developing a godly habit of prayer. Interestingly, the church thinks if you have a habit, you're in the flesh. No, you can have, everybody, you're going to have a habit of something, yes. right? Yes. It's either going to be good habits or bad habits. And the best habits are godly habits. Yes. Because that's how God has made us. And these men were continually praying. And their lives were marked by prayer. So God's revivalists are men and women of consistent and continual prayer. They live, they truly live by praying. And this is not religious praying. This is praying of, this is the praying of coming into the presence of God. And because God is life, He reinvigorates. You. He revives you. He refreshes you. You go in defeated. You know, how am I going to continue anymore? <laughs> you know, and then you come out yeah. with the fire filled, yeah. built up. And you don't just do it alone. You do it alone, but you also do it together with God's people. Yeah. And they were doing it together with God's people. Hallelujah. Uh, many years ago, I was blessed to go and visit David Hogan's ministry for three weeks. Do you know David Hogan? How many? Raise your hand if you heard of David Hogan. So I was a young uh, man then. Uh, I think it was about... 22 years old and they saw amazing miracles and I got to meet the people who were raised from the dead we prayed for people we climbed and hiked up mountains it was uh, a, an amazing trip it was a challenging tr trip on the flesh and one of the things that they did, though, is they spent the first two hours of every morning in prayer. So we'd wake up and just pray and seek God and worship and read the word for two hours. Then after that, they did the ministry. Now, some of them may spend three hours in prayer. David Hogan lived a lifestyle of work, and he still lives a lifestyle of worshiping and prayer. Now, this is where the power comes from. It comes from prayer. So God is looking for people to pray. We can't go forward unless we're first praying. So the first characteristic of a revivalist is prayer. Amen. Amen. Now the second characteristic here, the second mark is authenticity. And we find this in Acts 3-4. We see this man, and then when we go to Acts 3, 4, but Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. Look at us. God's leaders are examples and models. Paul says, follow my example. Join in following my example in Philippians 3.17. He also says, follow me as I follow Christ. We have an idea of leaders, and I hear it often in Australia. Well, don't look to the leaders. They're not Jesus, and they're, uh, you know, don't look to them. Look to Jesus. You know this mindset? Said because they fall short, they're they're sinners. Um, but real leaders are meant to live the life. Yes. They're meant to be an example. Now, in no way do we want them to eclipse Jesus. In no way do we want them to become idolized and above Jesus. Jesus is the true Lord, the true shepherd. But you need to be able to look at my life and see Christ in me and Christ at work through me. Yes. We need to be, if we're going to be God's leaders, we need to allow God to work in us such authenticity that we can say, look at us. Look at us. Look at what God has done. And I can look at Chris when he first came to Australia. Absolute mess. <laughs> there was one time... <laughs> 
as we would, but as we were fellowship, as God pulled them out of the pit, as we were fellowshipping and seeking God, and uh, I saw that there was a call in Chris and Cheryl's life. I saw that um, I felt that they were meant to be pastors and leaders. But at one time, it seemed like you guys were going in another direction from that, and my heart kind of broke. Uh, and I remember that whole that whole thing. But God has a way of forming and leading people. They, uh, I think all of that was leading them forward into what you are doing now. Hallelujah. And, um, and John would always say, yeah, these, they, they, they have something special. There's, something, there's an anointing on their life. And I'm so happy now to see them doing what God has created them to do. And it's gonna be, there's going to be more. There's going to be increase. There's going to be growth. Uh, Lord, I bless this place for increase and growth and expansion and, and moving into a new place and new students and fresh revelation and insight. And uh, yeah, I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done in Chris and Cheryl. Um, and you can look at them, and I could say look at them because they are following Jesus. They're seeking God. And for all of our lives, we want that to be the case. A leader's life, God's leaders are like a pattern or blueprint that you can follow. They never want to take the place, God's leaders never want to take the place of tr the true shepherd, Jesus. Yes. But they can say, look at me and follow me as I follow Christ. That doesn't mean that they're perfect. Even Paul said he didn't attain all these things, but he was passionately pursuing Jesus. So, yes, we will get the disappointed if we think leaders are going to be absolutely perfect. They're not going to be absolutely perfect like Jesus, but they need to be pursuing Jesus and a model. And if they fall, they need to be quick to get up and to repent. And I'm not talking about falling into adultery. I'm just talking about falling into discouragement and, and, and that. Of course, if someone falls into adultery, they should be disciplined. And it's interesting. We don't have any times of discipline and people uh, stepping aside from ministry because they're unfortunately what happens with pastors is your identity can be your ministry yeah. rather than your identity be a child of God, a worshiper. And when my pastor retired, I asked, he retired, he had been pastoring all his life, preaching all the time, and I said, how is it? You're not preaching anymore? And he says, oh, it's, it's fine because my identity has always been to be a child of God. He says, and uh, just two years later, he, he began to preach some more and the very church that he planted another ministry took it over and then he preached in that church just recently um, and a beautiful word so our identity needs to not be in ministry uh, that is outward ministry but in that personal relationship with Jesus so the second mark of a revivalist is authenticity the third is generosity Acts 3.6, Acts 3.6. So when we go to Acts 3.6, it says, But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. They had this generous spirit. I give this to you. And what people need is not silver and gold. Some people, you know, of course, we help the poor. But what people really need is something that goes beyond silver and gold. Yes. It is the spirit of God. It is the power of the spirit of God. It is the life of Jesus. And we are to be ministers of life. Real life. The spirit of life. So we revivalists are givers they have something tangible to give they give the word they give their lives they give their prayers they pour themselves out they have received much from God so that they can give much to others what did Jesus say to his disciples before he sent them out he said freely you have received freely give yeah. but you can only give as much as you re receive this is why you need to be constantly in prayer 
because it's in the place of prayer that you're constantly receiving. You want to grow in Christ, be at every prayer meeting that you can get to. Right? How this ministry started, say 18 years ago, was Chris and uh, first Chris and I think Cheryl, every, every Friday night, all night praying. We'd be praying at the airport. We'd be praying here. We'd be praying there. And uh, at times it was like, oh, we're too tired to pray. And we kept on praying. We kept on fasting. John also. It all began in prayer. It was all this, how, I wonder, how can Chris and Cheryl teach as much as they teach and minister as much as they minister? And he's flying planes too. How, it's all because over the years they have received much from the Lord. Yes. Are you seeing that? Yes. They received much. And then, so you, you're, like Chris was saying, you cup is being filled, 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 filled until it starts to overflow. Yes. And this can take years and years of happening. But God wants to bring you to a place where you are a giver. Now you start small and then you grow. It starts like a seed and then it grows from there. Revivalists are givers. They have something tangible to give. They have received much from God so that they can give much to others. They live to give, and they give life, resurrection life. Now, in Greek, anastasis is literally to stand up again. This anastasis is the word for resurrection. And ana, again, stasis, is derived from stand. So literally the word in Greek for resurrection is to stand up again. Yeah. And our mission is meant to cause people to stand up again. Yeah. Wow. This man was weak. He couldn't stand. He couldn't walk. But the ministry of life enabled him to walk. Yeah. They gave him something tangible. And it was not just that God moved outside of them. God moved through them to this man. Yes. See, God wants to not just do random miracles. He wants his power to be manifest through his people, yes. through his children, through his church. We're expecting God to do miracles apart from us, outside of us. But what God wants is he wants to do the miracles through us. Yes. Through us. His spirit through us. Be a good receiver so that you can be a good giver. Amen. Amen. Now this leads us to the fourth mark of a revivalist, and that is apostolicity. Apostolicity. There's a word for you. And it goes along the lines of what Chris was sharing last night. Acts 3, 6. A-P-O. S-T-O-L-I-C-I-T-Y. And it's pertaining to the characteristic of an apostle, a sent one. It is uh, apostolicity is that which is character is is apostolic in nature. That which is apostolic in nature. So we look at Acts three six and it says, but. Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The Nazarene walk. Yes. Now, it's this part that says in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the apostolic part. Because an apostle is a sent one. And the word, we can translate it as, it's, we take the word apostle, it sounds religious to us, right? An apostle, you know, some type of CEO over a whole bunch of churches. That's not what it meant to God. Literally, the word was a very uh, secular word in its origins. It's, it, it's an agent or an ambassador. I think the best way we could translate it is to say an agent or an ambassador or an emissary or an envoy. I'm going on Friday to uh, the, what is it, the United States outreach that's happening in Brisbane to claim Gideon's citizenship. I put all my, now Gideon, because he's been born in wedlock, and I'm American, and he was born in marriage 
to me. He's a legitimate son, and because he's a legitimate son, he has he is a U.S. citizen. But he doesn't get his U.S. citizenship unless it is claimed. And to claim, I have to prove that I'm a U.S. citizen and that I lived there for so many years after I was 14 years old. And it's a big process to prove. And oh, it took me days and days to work on these. Uh, Reports Now, the embassy is coming to Brisbane. And uh, we are going, on Friday we have our appointment and we're going to go there. And that is going to uh, seal his U.S. citizenship. And then in a few weeks they'll give him a U.S. passport. And, and uh, it, he can, he'll have a U.S. passport and an Australian passport. And uh, we'll see where God takes him. So... Uh, but anyway, these people that are coming, this, this team that is coming to Brisbane, they represent the United States. It's not just anybody. They have to be officially sent. They have to be authorized. They have to have the authority. No one can just give you citizenship. They have to be authorized, sent. So they represent, even though nobody knows their names, the lady uh, that's dealing with us, her name is Riza. I, I don't know her, but she has, uh, I never heard of her. Her name, you know, she's not on the news, but she represents the U.S. government and has the authority. And when these men say, in the name of Jesus, we think of in the name of Jesus as something we tack on at the end of our prayers. And if, if we do this, there's a magical formula, formula and God will hear us. So make sure you pray in the name of Jesus. No, it means to pray as someone representing Christ and his will as his ambassador. And the only way to be his ambassador is to be under his lordship and authority and doing what he says. If you're not sent, then you're a false authority. What if somebody said, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen and so I'd like to start my own embassy. <laughs> and this is, this was what a lot of Christians do. You know, I'm a, I'm a Christian. I could just start a church. Well, have you been sent by God? Is this something? Because what churches are meant to be is embassies of the kingdom. Yes. You just don't start a church. You need to be sent by God. Yes. You don't just start a ministry. Let it be His ministry. Because God is not wanting more of us. Yes. More of Him. Yes. And Him through us. Yes. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yes. And this is why he's got to bring us through that grinding process to humble us so that it's his ministry, it's Christ in us, and we are doing everything we do in the name of Jesus. And it's not just in word only, but it's in reality. It's an authenticity. So I know when I came to Australia, I did not come of my own accord. I didn't, you know, of in my early years, I didn't dream, oh, I want to go to Australia when I get older. I had no idea about Australia. And it was never even, never even my mind. My heart was for America and for revival in America. But then, while I was praying uh, in Pensacola, God said, I'm sending you to Brisbane. And I was walking through Brisbane City, and he says, I want you to plant the church right here which has been very difficult because it's not easy because it's so expensive in the center city. But God has made a way. Amen. So I can't do everything, but I can do the thing that he has sent me to do. And that's where you have the authority. These men, after spending... Year after spending years with Jesus, following him, now represent him. But they would never represent him, Peter and John would never represent him unless they were discipled by Jesus, unless they spent that time with him, unless they were receiving his word. And so now they say, in the name of Jesus, they've been sent by him. The reason why Moses 
did these great miracles was not because he was a great man of God. It was because God sent him. I mean, he was like before the Red Sea, like, oh, what's going to happen now? And God says, raise it up. <laughs> he was more afraid than anybody else, right? <laughs> but it's because God sent him. And so when we're wondering why aren't miracles happening, we really need to come to a place, this place of are we being obedient to God? Yes. Because unless the miracles are coming out of obedience, they are something false, yeah. right? But when they're coming out of some uh, obedience, it's reflecting God's will and purpose. So what do I mean by apost apostolicity? It is that these leaders represent Christ. They are ambassadors. The apostles are sent ones, agents. And they did miracles in the name of Jesus. And this was not based on their own authority or their own righteousness, but because they were sent and Christ gave them and his righteousness. They even say this. We're, we're not anybody special. It's, it's all because of Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Apostolicity. And this is something that God's forming in the church. And this is what Chris beautifully was developing last night. Uh, have you taught that here? Bits. Bits. Yeah. Well, make sure you teach that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Make sure you teach them. So the first four marks are the foundational marks we're looking at. Now we're going into part two, power and love. Let's move into this now. So part two of marks of a, of a revivalist, marks of a revivalist, and number five, empowerment. So when we look at Acts 3, 6 again... But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, walk. God's le leaders, God's leaders enable you to walk. Amen. To live a life like Jesus. Yes. Now this miracle, as well as all the miracles, were signs. We get caught up in the sign. It's like somebody at a highway, you know, hanging out a sign. Hey, look, I'm at the sign of the Sydney sign. And the sign says 300 kilometers away. Hey, I've arrived, dancing around the sign. But no, 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 it's just a sign. The sign's pointing to something else. And why this lame man walked is because God is trying to say, I want my people to walk. Yes. I want their leg strengthened. I want them to walk it out, to be able to follow me, to live the life, not to say one thing and not do another. Yes. But again, it takes maturity to walk, and it takes the power of God. And the power of God hit this man and enabled him to walk. So God's leaders empower others. And unfortunately, with a lot of churches, Churches is that you have everybody's lame. Nobody can walk, right? And we're not making fun of being lame. I had to, as a young kid, I suffered from Crohn's disease. I know what it is to be crippled, uh, crippled with pain. Uh, I know what it is to uh, uh, not be able to keep any food down. Uh, I became skinny stick and they said I had about three days to live so I'll take them to Disneyland no Disney World so I went to Disney World and I couldn't enjoy Disney World because I was so sick and vomiting everywhere so I know what it's like to be abased right and to be but praise the Lord I'm here and I'm standing. Thank you, Jesus. And I did not die. And I was a Jewish a doctor. I, they took me from doctor to doctor. They couldn't figure out what's wrong with this kid. And they said it was this. They said it was that. And then there's this tall man. Uh, I found out his name. His first name is Jer Jeremiah Levine. And he came with his uh, kippah on, his yarmulke. 
and he was tall and he came in, he poked around in my stomach. This is after about a year going from doctor to doctor. They couldn't figure out what was going wrong. He poked around in my stomach. He says, I think I know what it is. It's Crohn's disease. And we'll be able to treat it and he can get back to normal. And he was right. They did the colonoscopy and they found out he was right, and I was supposed to be on medicine all my life, but I'm not, I haven't been on medicine since I was 13 years old. So God has sustained me and kept me. Praise the Lord. Um, God is good. Anyway, he doesn't, I'm doing a spiritual illustration here. We come into churches, everybody's lame, talking spiritually. They can't walk. They're suffering from the same addictions, the same secret sins. Yeah. They're not able to minister. They can't walk. And then a lot of leaders are just enabling them to stay lame. Yes. Yeah. Lame. When we should be empowering them to walk. Yes. And each one should be able to walk and represent Christ. Yes. And they have a ministry that's in their heart that they can serve in. Yeah. Which may be uh, not just in the four walls, but most likely outside the four walls. Amen? So God's leaders, He wants to make you into those who minister power to others. So how does this happen? This happens as leaders feed you the word and bring you to maturity. A baby can't walk, but as a child matures, he or she learns to walk. And leaders and revivalists equip you so that you can walk like Jesus. They teach you how to follow Jesus. And again, this cannot happen except by the power of God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Yeah. Next mark of an evangelist is touch. Touch. Now, Acts 3, 6 then says, They said walk, but they didn't just say the words, but they backed it up with their touch. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. So God's leaders offer more than words. They preach the word, but they also extend their hand to help people up. Yes. And it's a critical characteristic of all leaders that their words are matched by their tender touch. I was reading a story in a book, I think the book is called Leadership Jazz, where the, the man writing it uh, is talking about a baby, I think it's his grandson that was born premature. And the doctor said, I want you to come in. And I, I think the, the parents were gone. And I, the doctor said, I want you to come in. And I want you to speak to this premature baby, very small. And, and then just, con uh, just touch the baby so that the baby connects the wo your loving words with your touch. And from there he begins to develop in this book about how leaders have to be speak, but they also need to have that lover, loving, tender touch, that kindness with people, um, being able to extend their hand and show kindness and love. And it's not just words, but it is uh, extended in their actions. So it's a critical characteristic of all leaders that their words are matched by their tender touch through your hands and actions, pull people up. Now, the pulling of them up, we're talking about tender touch, but here we see it's quite, it seems quite violent because they're like, they seize them and <laughs> pull them up. So again, sometimes it's quite, it may seem quite violent, but it brought them good, yeah. right? It brought them good. And it was, though it was God's kindness in seizing him and pulling him up. It was God's kindness. So remember, the laying on of hands in Hebrews 6 is a foundational doctrine. So it talks about the laying on of hands. That's a foundational doctrine. It's because God wants us to be His hands to people. And life comes through our hands. It comes through our body. It comes through our touch. So this is seven. Love. Uh, another mark of a revivalist is love. 
three seven, and seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. So in the same way, it's the love in a leader's heart that raises people up. Love moves them to pull people out of the pit. Love motivates them to strengthen God's people. And it's through love that people's lives are transformed. They go from being lame, unable to live life effectively, to dancing and praising God. So this is what happens when you're in the presence of God. He pours His love into your hearts by the Holy Spirit. And so you love people, and this is why you are fishing for men. This is why you're reaching lost people. This is why you're, why you're helping God's people. It always has to be, at the very heart, love-motivated. Yes. Motivated by love. Not by us wanting to be esteemed or lifted up, but us wanting to lift others up. Yes. I had a little joke, though, that I sent out on Facebook, and some people liked it. You had Darth Vader, and he was holding some guy up by his hand, and it says, strong people lift others up. They don't bring them down. <laughs> of course, it's just a joke. <laughs> We don't get our model of leadership from Darth Vader. <laughs> but there is a new Star Wars coming out, and it looks quite interesting. And, and at the end of the little clip, the little trailer, you see, who's, that, who's the, uh, the bad guy? Uh, you know, you see the bad guy extending his hand out to the young woman, Kyle, Kyle Loren, you know, and he's extending his hand out. And what is she going to do? Is she going to grab his hand? Is she going to go to the dark side? And I'll tell you, in your life, there's going to be people like that, that false teachers. People say, oh, you know, it, it's going it to like love but it's not really love people extending their hand and saying come you know join me make sure you take the hand of people who really know Jesus amen bless your sister so the next bless you, the next characteristic is worship and praise Acts 3 8 through 10 we see this with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were all taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So revivalists are catalysts for explosive and jubilant worship and praise. Because of their ministry, people are filled with joy and thanks to God. Their churches are filled with praise. And while God uses leaders, the purpose of the leader is that people would be led into God's presence and glory. Yes. So it first starts off at, look at me, they're an example, but then it's leading them yes. to Jesus, yes. praising God. And Amen. we are to foster worship and praise. Amen? Amen. What, I want to encourage you, we're going to end quite soon here. There's 12 characteristics, but I'll go quickly through the other ones. And I want to encourage you to spend just a few, at least a few minutes at the end, worshiping and praising God. Amen. Even though it's late, you'll be amazed at what God does in the prayer time at the end. Yeah. We had an amazing time of prayer last night. Yes. And I remember last time we came to the school, God, it was like an explosion of God's power and glory as we prayed together. So I want to encourage you, I know that just sacrifice 20 minutes of sleep and stay for 20 minutes and pray and watch what God does. Amen? And you'll feel so revitalized in your spirit that you're not going to need the extra sleep. Okay? <laughs> but I won't end too late. I'm going to go quickly through these. In a... So now the last thing, part three, is true shepherds. True shepherds. This leads to the last marks of a revivalist. And nine is that they gather. Acts 3, 11 
while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people. And he began to preach to them. But what happened uh, is that Peter gathered the people. And it was that they were attracted to him somehow divinely. And revivalists are like this. Revivalists are gatherers. They have a divine anointing to gather people. People are drawn to them as sheep are drawn to a shepherd. And it may not be a large gathering. Most revivals have started through small groups. Nevertheless, the power of God draws people. And all these people were drawn to Peter. Later it says it started, the church started with 3,000, then it moved to 5,000 during this time. Leaders have a shepherd's heart even for those who want to remain independent. <laughs> There's some people that want to remain in, independent, but the shepherd wants to gather. And it's in the gathering that more and more people are saved. If you, if you fast forward here to 4.4 4, after the preaching, after Peter preached, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Yeah. So there was great growth that happened. But don't despise the day of small things. Yeah. Ten yeah. is that leaders feed. Revivalists, God's leaders feed. God's leaders feed the people. And we see Peter preaches. Peter saw the people and what did he do? He preached the word of God to them. I'll read some of these words here. Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted life. No, it's confrontational. <laughs> but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you and know and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all and this message goes on what is it about he's feeding them Jesus yes. and he's teaching them about faith well they thought their righteousness was through keeping the law but he's teaching them about faith in Jesus God's leaders feed people just like shepherds feed sheep. And they feed people Jesus because He is the true Word. Yes. He is the true food, the bread of life. They feed people the Word of God, not their own opinions because the Word is Jesus. Revivalists resolve to know nothing except Christ and Him crucified. Yes. So when the people gather, sometimes what we do is we entertain them. He's not entertaining them. He's confronting them with Jesus. Yes. But also in the confrontation, and he's also extending mercy to them as well. So we need not be afraid of preaching and teaching and feeding people Jesus. He is the power of God, not us. Not our, not our entertainment, not our feasts. It's wonderful to have a feast, but not our, not our feast, not our entertainment, not the you know, power of our amplification system. May God use all these things for his glory, but the real source of life is Jesus Christ. Amen? Yes. Eleven. Carry your cross. And Acts 4, 1 through 3, we see that Peter and John suffer persecution. They're put into jail for what they preached and what they did. Revivalists are willing to suffer persecution and misunderstanding for ministering Christ. They know being a disciple of Christ means carrying your cross. The greatest miracles may lead to the greatest persecution. However, we count the cost and know that Jesus is worth it. Yes, yes the very people we are helping may want to crucify us like they did Jesus. That's one of the grinding processes is the very people 
helping, fight against you, gossip about you, say all sorts of evil things about you. They crucify you with their words and their actions. And yet we're meant to forgive them and love them, have mercy. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We are shepherds who lay down our lives for the sheep. This is what it means to be God's leaders. And lastly, 12, is God's leaders multiply. Amen. Acts 4.4, 4, as we read before, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. God's leaders multiply, and through their ministry comes growth. At times... There may seem like long seasons of no growth. But if we are putting God first, what's happening is the growth is happening underground and internally. In other words, the seed is sprouting roots. Yes. It will break through the surface. The seedling will grow because life causes growth. Yes. Yes. Soon the growth will be visible. But be faithful to God when it's invisible, okay? Because it's, it's hard when you're a young church, much of the growth is internal. God is laying foundations. And when the growth is internal and invisible, a lot of people drop out because they want to see something. I want to see something, you know. And we all want to see something. God's put it in our heart to see something. But we have to go down the way of Christ to see true life. Weeds grow really fast. Yeah. But there's no life in them. They kill. But a real plant is going to take time and work to grow. Uh, it's going to take much prayer and many years to really grow. So as we are faithful to live the life, love people, preach Jesus, and make disciples, God will cause the multiplication. And I really want to encourage you to make disciples. Get around the younger people, uh, younger in Christ, and teach them the word. Spend some time with them. Pray with them. And this will cause them to grow and it will it will be frustrating at times because you're going to see them fall and trip and kind of go away and you'll have a vision that God gives you for them and they may disappoint you but still keep on discipling amen, amen. keep on loving because a lot of people have to learn the hard way yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you can't do it for them. It's like a parent, and you're watching your kids suffer and do this and that. And, but eventually, train a child in the way they should go, and when they old, they will not depart from it. So God will cause the multiplication. Just remember, don't despise the day of small things. Everything with God begins as a seed. Even faith begins as a mustard seed. Hallelujah. And this brings us to our end of marks of a revivalist. Now you may look at this passage and may have some other marks, and that's wonderful. But I believe we got at the essence of what God is speaking to us tonight from this passage. Amen? So let's stand. I'm going to pray, and then we'll uh, join hands and, and pray and, and worship before we close the night.